Hello, uh, I'm Tariq Malik, a managing editor for Space.com. Uh, with us today, uh, very graciously, is uh, Dr. Uh, Don Yeomans of uh, NASA's Near Earth uh, Object uh, Program Office at the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Don, thanks, thanks for being here today. Glad to be here. Great. Well, well you're the chief of, of the NEO Program Office at JPL. Um, can you give us an idea of what the office does and what types of objects you track in the night sky? Well, basically, our office takes observations from astronomers all over the world and computes their orbits and then tracks their motion about 100 years into the future to see if there's any uh, interesting close Earth approaches for comets and asteroids. And if there are interesting close Earth approaches, then we do impact probabilities. How likely is it that one of these objects may actually hit the Earth? And then we publish these results and make them available to astronomers so that they can take a look at which objects are of most interest to us, and so those are the objects that they will preferentially observe in the future. And, and for the public, why uh, why should folks who maybe don't don't study asteroids or, or comets for a living? What 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 is the importance to them? Why should they be interested in these objects themselves? Well, these asteroids uh, and comets are interesting from a number of points of view. First of all, scientifically, they left they're the leftover bits and pieces from the early solar system formation process. So, if we wish to study the chemical mix and the thermal environment under which our solar system formed, then we'd like to study these objects. They also delivered to the early Earth much of the water and organic materials that allowed life to form. Subsequent collisions punctuated evolution, allowing only the most adaptable species, that's us, uh, to progress further. Uh, they have potential for space resources. They're very high in platinum group elements uh, in the future, and, and if we don't find them and track them, we may not have a future. Well, I hope we, <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> you also have a, a recent book out um, yeah. on near Earth objects. Tell us about that, and, and maybe where your your interest in these objects came from. Uh, if it's something you always wanted to look at in the sky. Well, comets and asteroids in the Earth's neighborhood uh, is a relatively new area of research because about 20 years ago and prior to that, people didn't really pay attention to all the objects that were sort of whizzing past the Earth uh, from time to time. But in the 1990s, NASA began a near-Earth object program where they systematically uh, looked for these objects as they went by the Earth. And so my thought was, well, it's such a new area, and uh, it, we need a primer or a, a reference work to, for the public to, to look for to get up to speed on why these objects are important. And um, I'm just in, 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 in putting the, the book together, I mean, was, was it... The story of near-Earth object uh, uh, discovery. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how you view that uh, from you know the beginning, where maybe folks didn't didn't even know uh, about the, the the frequency or uh, or or the the threat until it, it crashed into the the peak scale car. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to to now where we, we track them fairly regularly and and we even send spacecraft to go visit them. Yeah, the interest in near-Earth objects has really accelerated from the 1990s uh, when we only knew about a, a few of these objects that are flying by. So if you look at the discovery rate as a function of time since the mid-1990s, it's really dramatic. So we're, we're discovering thousands of objects each year. In fact, there's about 10,000 objects that we know about, uh, about 1,500 of which can get quite close to the Earth. And, and so those are the objects, the so-called potentially hazardous asteroids that we pay most attention to. And, and for you personally, uh, to be dedicated to that field, I mean, there must be a draw uh, that, that you find extremely fulfilling and interesting. I mean, what is it about them to you that just makes them kind of an object of, of wonder and then also, you know, something to, 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 ward, to protect against? Well, as I mentioned, uh, they're interesting from a science point of view. They're interesting from a origins point of view, mm -hmm. our origins. Uh, they're interesting from a point of view of future resources in space if we wish to develop structures and use the water resources in these asteroids and comets uh, for sustaining life, break the water down into hydrogen and oxygen, mm -hmm. which is rocket fuel. So one day these objects may be the, the watering holes and fueling stations for interplanetary travel. So, And then, of course, there's the threat. That's right. always uh, there. And uh, so it's all of these things that makes them interesting to me and, and to the public. So. And it's our job to make sure that uh, none of them takes us by surprise. Well, the, 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 the threat of, of potentially hazardous asteroids, um, and it's, uh, I guess, 
I'm wondering if there's a disconnect between the actual threat, the perception that you, or the, the, the facts that you track, um, you know, through the solar system, and then the perceived threat, maybe to the public or, or through the media. Is there, you know, is there a, a progression there? Is there a, a communication that still has to, to be worked out? How do you see yeah. that relationship uh, if you find one that is potentially hazardous? Well, it's, it's difficult uh, to get the complexities of this, uh, predicting these objects uh, to the public, because when we first discover them, their orbits are so uncertain that we really can't say where in its orbit it's going to be at a particular time very accurately. But as we get additional observations, the uncertainty region gets smaller and smaller, and our ability to track it into the future gets better and better. So very often we start with not being able to rule out a an Earth impact in such and such year in the future, and then we get additional observations and we say, yes, we have ruled that out. In fact, uh, in the last two weeks, last two months, we've ruled out three objects as potential impactors. And that's uh, AG5, uh, the asteroid Apophis, Apophis, which is a very famous, right. uh, uh, well-known, and the other one would be? Uh, 2012 uh, DA14, mm -hmm. which is still going to make a very close approach uh, on the 15th of February. In fact, it's going to come within the ring of communication satellites that will be announcing its arrival. Oh, great. Well, to, to, I guess to, to, to rule them out as, as impact risks uh, based on your analysis, what, what actually is a potentially hazardous asteroid, and uh, how many observations do you need to rule out the chances of an impact within a, a given flyby? Well, we call potentially hazardous asteroids, uh, they have to have two characteristics. They have to be large enough to make it through the Earth's atmosphere and cause damage, so they have to be oh, about 100 meters or so, or larger, and they have to pass within something like 7.5 million miles of the Earth's orbit, so they can have to get, have the capability of getting close to the Earth. And uh, when we discover one of these potentially hazardous asteroids, it's always optically, we're using optical detectors, and then if they get close, uh, during the discovery operation or shortly thereafter, we get the radars on them. There's two radars, one in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and another in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. And so if we can get the radars on them right after we discover them, then we can nail the orbit for another 100 or 200 years and just run them out and mm -hmm. see if there's a problem. If not, put it aside and go on to the next one. Is there a concern that when they do make a, maybe a really close approach, like we're going to see with uh, DA14 in February, that that can change its orbit in a, a, a different way and has to, you have to do follow-up observations after that point? That's a good point. Uh, yeah, a very close approach to a planet, uh, the Earth or Mars, uh, uh, generally makes it more difficult to predict where it's going to be thereafter. So yes, uh, once it goes by the Earth, particularly uh, this DA14 on February 15th, there'll be a, a request to the observers, the amateurs included, uh, to provide additional uh, data on its position with respect to the background stars so we can once again refine its orbit and then predict where it's going to be in the next couple of hundred years. Okay. Can you tell us more about the, just the DA-14 event itself? You know, how large is that asteroid? Uh, I know that it was discovered uh, just recently and that it has been watched um, and what maybe uh, amateur astronomers might want to look forward to uh, when it comes by. Well. 2012 DA-14 is a 40 meter sized object, you know, about half the size of a football field in diameter. It's uh, going to pass within 4.4 uh, Earth radii of the Earth's surface. And so that's extremely close. Uh, it's going to go from south to north very rapidly, uh, but it'll only be observed by folks who in Eastern Europe, uh, Asia, in Australia, so it's not going to be an easy object to see, even for those folks, and it, it'll be in the daylight sky for U.S. observers. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's an object that's extremely interesting because it actually passes within many of the satellites that are in orbit around the Earth, um, about the distance of the, uh, some of the <laughs> GPS satellites. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're making available to the satellite providers a file of positions of the asteroid as it goes from south to north and makes its close approach on the 15th. And they can take their predictions of where their satellite will be and then do comparisons. How close will my satellite get to this asteroid? Mm -hmm. And so far, there, there's no problem. And, and I would assume that you will have the, the radar instruments aim squarely at this object, too, to get more, yes, more insight on it? Yes, yes. The radars will be uh, 
aimed at this object, uh, it, not, in, not at the very closest approach because it's not on the right side of the Earth, but uh, they will be observing it a couple of hours later and getting uh, observations not only of, of its position, uh, its range, and, and the so-called Doppler effect, which measures its radial velocity along the line of sight, uh, but it'll actually be doing um, uh, four meter resolution uh, shape modeling. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to understand this object uh, down to the four meter level. And, and do we know what type of, of asteroid it is? I know that there's several different types in terms of composition. Right. And I'm wondering what that matters in terms of either their, their potential as a threat or just their, their role in the formation of the solar system. Well, this object is thought to be, like most asteroids, uh, a so-called ordinary chondrite, uh, which is a silicate rock, really. Uh, and it's, it's one of the most common types of mm -hmm. uh, asteroid types. So it's an S-type, so-called S-type for silicates. And, and then there's a, a, the carbonaceous type, right, the C-type. There is. Uh, the more interesting types actually are the C-types because they, they are covered with, they're composed of uh, organic materials and sometimes water ice. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are the objects that are most interesting for delivering to the early Earth much of the carbon-based materials that allowed life to form. They're most interesting because we could one day perhaps mine them for their water resources and break the water down into hydrogen, oxygen, which is rocket fuel. So these C types, which are the more rare type, mm -hmm. uh, are actually more interesting. Space.com.